So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. Starting a new series based on Richard Rohr's book, Dancing, Standing Still, Healing the World from a Place of Prayer. Based on my last series, you know that right now I'm in a season of real fascination and curiosity about prayer and what it means to pray um, that soul and separate from the idea of simply closing your eyes bowing your head um, holding your hands in a certain way and I've known about Richard Rohr now for close to 15 years he is a Franciscan monk and the Franciscans order of monkhood or the monastery uh, system in which they align themselves has always been a very fascinating one to me and that is actually something I think I'm going to start to explore on my new YouTube, YouTube channel so um, stay tuned I will give you more information as that comes up but for right now let's go into the first essay that is found in Dancing Standing Still, and then uh, we'll have some conversation around it. The title of the essay is called The Greatest Art Form, The Dance of Action and Contemplation. It starts with a quote by Thomas Merton, I die by brightness and the Holy Spirit. The essay starts, I believe that the combination of human action from a contemplative center is the greatest art form. It underlies all those other more visible art forms that we see in great sculpture, music, writing, painting, and most especially in the art form called human character. When action and contemplation are united, we always have beauty, symmetry, and transformation. Lives and actions that inherently sparkle and heal even with dark images. With most humans the process begins on the action side. In fact the entire first half of life for most of us, even introverts, is all about action. We begin with crawling, walking, playing, speaking. We learn, we experiment, we try, we do, we stumble, we fall, we break, and we find. Gradually these enactments grow larger and more mature, but we remain largely unaware of our inner motivations. Yes, there are feelings and imaginings during this time, maybe even sustained prayer, study, or disciplined thought, but do not call that contemplation. These reflections are necessarily and almost always self-reverential, both for good and for ill. Do not be put off by this. At this point, life is still largely about me and finding my own preferred and proper viewing platform. It has to be. But it is not yet the great art form of the union between action and contemplation. We must go further. 
The teaching and guidance that is needed is about process more than content. How can I see and use my actions and my reflections to expand and not to contract? How can I listen for God and learn God's voice, which is much more important than knowing God's precise name and plan? How can I keep my heart, mind, and soul open, quote, in hell, unquote? This should be the early form of spiritual teaching, not what to see, but how to see. I am afraid this cannot usually be taught in book or catechism form. It is picked up largely by rubbing off parents and significant others. Could this be the real laying on of hands, the deepest meaning of apostolic secession? Could this be the way the Spirit is passed from vessel to vessel? I think so. If such soul work is learned, usually by osmosis, we will keep growing, and the contemplative side of the soul will begin to show itself. There are already hints and guesses, as T.S. Eliot would put it, in the first half of life. And some chosen souls, like Therese of Lisieux or Gerald Manley Hopkins, seem to get the hints and guesses easily. But most of us, however, it is a longer process of being drawn by lightness, brightness, and the Holy Spirit, as, Morton, as Merton says. Note that Merton says he dies by this brightness. Because although we are pulled into the mystery through our actions and beyond our actions in the first half of life, it might be felt and experienced as a kind of dying, a dying into what always feels bigger and brighter. Contemplation is first of all a series of losses, largely of our illusions. If we do not enter deeply the early learning process of how, we will use our actions to defend ourselves, protect ourselves from our shadow, and build a leaden manhole cover over our own unconscious. We will settle for being right instead of being holy and whole, for saying prayers instead of being one. The ego wants containment and control. It is the only soul that wants meaning and mystery. In fact, that is how I know whether it is my ego that is leading or brightness and the Holy Spirit. If I have not found a way to hear and allow that deeper level of soul, I will use all my roles, my relationships, and even my religion to fortify my ego and my private agenda. I might even say a lot of prayers but it will not be the spacious prayer of contemplation. The big field has not yet opened up. The brightness has not yet happened. Jesus said when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. Contemplation waits for the moments, creates the moments, where all can be a silent prayer. It refuses the very distinction between action and stillness. Contemplation is essentially non-dual consciousness that overcomes the gap between me and God, outer and inner, either and or, me and you. So how has this been showing up in my life lately? The law, the Ten Commandments, those things that many people think about when they think about God. 
many times is about rule following, rule breaking, who's keeping the rules, who's not keeping the rules, who looks like they're doing the right things, who clearly does not look like they're doing the right things. And I've been caught up in that system for a really long time. Except the problem was, many times, I was the one put on the outside of the system for being female, for being African American, for being below middle class, for not knowing the right people. And so what tends to happen is the ego comes in and it can do a couple of things. I'll, I'll say what it's done for me. Either I'm looking for ways to poke holes in the ones that are in, or I spend a lot of time trying to manifest a better version, more acceptable version to the construct I've been given. But one day, not so very long ago, something inside me whispered, there's something more. And I was so tired of trying to live within the constructs of this religious life, trying to be good enough, trying to be chosen, trying to be a part of some sort of leadership experience that I just surrendered. And suddenly I'm finding prayer in everything. Prayer in the conversations I'm having. Prayer in the walks I'm taking. Prayer in the breath. Prayer when I'm uh, doing yoga or running or walking. Prayer when I'm cooking. All the things I might have read about before. But suddenly, it's happening within me. And I can't explain it other than to say that I have never felt more myself because I now think less about myself. And I say that not in some sort of self-deprecating way. I feel confident. I feel like I have a place in the world. I feel like God has given me grounding, grounding in a way that no one had to give to me because it was already there. I invite you into that same stream of understanding. What are your views on the law and the rules and the ways in which we like to categorize who Jesus is, what it means for the world, what God is doing in the world, and does he even have any sort of say about who you are and what your identity is?